So these are a couple of modules uh, for transmitting and receiving on 433 megahertz. So this is a receiver and in my last video I went through some Python code on the Raspberry Pi on how to receive uh, transmissions from things like uh, this key fob. Uh, but I didn't go through this module on the other side which is the transmitter. So it's a very basic uh, module. Uh, and it transmits on 433 megahertz and it does so by either um, transmitting or not transmitting uh, for setting levels high and low so when it's not transmitting it's not really consuming any power so in this video uh, I'll take the code which I wrote last time which is to receive uh, communications and I'll I'll make a couple of additional applications uh, so the first one will be uh, first we'll just transmit on on this using the Raspberry Pi uh, and then on another one of these modules which I've got in a, in a separate part of the room I'll be receiving the transmission uh, and decoding it uh, and then uh, as an additional um, application I'll also have one where I transmit on this key fob and I receive on the receiver like I did in the last video but I'll execute a command, uh, execute a program on the Raspberry Pi depending on which button's pressed uh, and ignore communications from other devices. So this PCB uh, doesn't do much. Um, all it does is really sort of level shift. So I've got a couple of regulators on here. I've got a 12 volt regulator and a 5 volt regulator. So the 12 volt regulators, um, the more voltage you can put through the transmitter, uh, the more powerful the transmission is. Uh, and these modules have a limit of um, 12 volts although the actual device for transmitting has a limit of 30 volts but on the back there's uh, a couple of transistors and one of the transistors limits um, the voltage to 12 volts so that's all you can put through it uh, and then the 5 volts is to run the receiver uh, and I have a, a socket for a pick my controller for that's for future use which I'm not using at the minute but also I've got these this header where I can take this out to a Raspberry Pi and so it has a ground pin and it has a receive pin and a transmit pin uh, and it just receives and transmits on a single single wire. So I'm connected to two Raspberry Pis here at the top uh, on this Raspberry Pi. Um, I'm going to use this to actually transmit a message uh, and then on the bottom here I'm going to use this Raspberry Pi to actually receive the message. Um, so this first application on the left, that was the one that I covered in the last video. Uh, and I'm going to cover these other applications. Lastly, I'll cover this one, which is which matches um, data received from something like a key fob, or it could be anything. And then depending on what data has been matched, it'll execute a command um, depending on whatever button has been pressed. Uh, but just now I'm going to demonstrate these two programs. Uh, so this one receives a message from a Raspberry Pi and this one transmits a message from a Raspberry Pi. So in the bottom window I'll start up the um, receive application uh, and if it gets a message from uh, something which uh, isn't me transmitting then it will say that it doesn't recognize the signature. And I'll go over the, the source code and explain exactly what it's doing uh, afterwards. Uh, so if I go to the top window, so this uh, application which is transmitting, it takes a single argument and that's, uh, say, a message that you want to send. So if I just type test message, uh, see that invalid packet there, that was something else transmitting and it received it and recognised it wasn't me transmitting. So if I hit enter at the, at the top screen now, uh, so it transmits this packet of data from the top receives it down the bottom here and it decodes it and says okay that's the message I sent so I could send a, a different message so if I send a different message and it will receive that and it decodes that so it's very simple code to actually do that and I'll go for that code so this is the code for transmitting uh, and if I just go through this very basically, at the top I've got some constants which define 
uh, how I pass in the arguments. So I'm just uh, have one argument, which is uh, passing the data string. Uh, just the GPO pins for doing the transmit and doing the receive on. Uh, and then for the transmit and receive, this is like in the last application, which has covered in the previous video. And I've just tuned these values a bit. Um, I tuned them in, in the previous application, but here I'm, I'm using some slow, fairly slow values um, just to uh, make the data transmission more reliable. Uh, and I have a, I'm going to do a very basic encryption. Uh, it's not, it's not a very secure encryption, but just as a demonstration of how to send data uh, across this transmission link. And the data that I send, each time I send it, it's going to have this signature. So these four bytes here will be the first four bytes which always get sent. Then the receiving program can identify the, these four bytes as, as being pretty unique. Uh, and uh, thinking that if it sees these four bytes as the first bytes transmitted, it's probably a message. And then there's uh, some other checks can do as well later on just to validate there is a message sent from the transmitting program. So when I send the data, I send it as a packet of data, so um, a, a set of uh, bits of data. So first of all, it sends a signature, then it tells uh, sends a byte saying how, how many bytes are going to be contained in the data, and then it will send the data, and then the checksum value at the end, which is a single byte, which just um, does a, v a validity check to make sure it hasn't been corrupted in, during transmission. So I've got a couple of subroutines. This one's to actually transmit a single byte. So it goes through each bit of, of the of the byte which is being transmitted. It gets the bit. Um, and when you transmit on these uh, devices, although you can have ones and zeros, what's typically done is you have, each time the level changes, it's the next, it's the next bit. And if you have a, uh, a single period, then it's a, considered a binary zero. Or if you have a level of, which is two periods long, then it's considered binary one. Uh, so, so for each bit, it changes the, the level of the output. Um, and it will sleep for, for a bit zero, it will sleep for one period. But if it's a bit one, uh, then it will sleep for an additional period to signify it's a, uh, a binary one. And I've got um, a basic encryption routine. It's very simple, it's not secure at all. Uh, but it's very, but it just demonstrates in this application how um, the data is sent, and it keeps this application nice and nice and small as well, and, and easier to understand. Uh, uh, then just set up GPI pins on the Raspberry Pi for doing the transmit. Uh, then just validate, just make sure that the argument I'm passing in is 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 a single. There is an argument present to actually transmit the data. It just sets up the data in the packet. So that structure I um, showed further up, which is the a packet of data, it just puts in uh, the data uh, as it's going to be sent. And it splits up the string into a, a set of um, characters, and then it converts those characters into their hex value, so a numeric value, so it can so it can send them byte by byte. It does a basic encryption on the data. And it works out a checksum for the actual packet of data, so that when the packet packet of data is received, uh, the receiving program can run a checksum as well. And if the value matches the checksum which is sent in the packet with the checksum which is calculated, then it, it's a good um, sign that it's the, the the data is valid. Uh, then I just go for sending sending the data once the packet been um, put together, and that's just a matter of calling. Um, so oh, first of all I have to send a start bit so initially to initiate communication just send like a single bit of data which is uh, the first transition uh, and it just um, sleeps for how, however many start bits you want it's usually just one bit that you send as a start bit uh, then it just calls this the function to send a byte to send each thing so it sends uh, each byte of the signature it sends the length of data and then each byte of the data, then it sends a checksum byte. And then at the end, it makes sure the transmitter is turned off. Uh, if the transmitter is left on, then it just wastes your battery if you're using the battery. Uh, also, it'll probably block other things from sending signals because it'll be always on. So you want to make sure the transmit 
the transmitter's turned off at the end. And then I just sleep for an end period to signify that um, it's, it's the end of transmission. So that if this application is called twice in succession, it will at least have uh, that period between each transmission uh, so that it separates the messages out. So the receiving the application is very similar. Um, so I define the pins I'm going to use for the transmitter and receiver. Again, the values for transmitting and receiving, like the type periods and stuff, um, they should all pretty much match the transmit program because uh, it should be sending and receiving at the same frequency and things like that. Uh, the encryption key needs to be exactly the same as in the transmit program, and so does the packet signature, so it can identify it's a valid packet. Um, the encrypt and decrypt routine is exactly the same. Um, so what uh, what happens is if you encrypt uh, a series of bytes using this encryption um, function, if you call it again with the encrypted data, it will just it'll come out like it's decrypted. Uh, so it just makes it nice and simple for the demonstration. Um, I just set up the GPO pins um, as they're required. And I set up a set of variables uh, for each iteration. So this, this uh, application will actually just keep running. So the transmit one, you quit the command line argument, it runs once, but this one just sits there waiting for new messages to come in. So it will be in an infinite loop. So I define the packet of data in the same way as it was in the um, transmit program. Uh, then it goes into the infinite loop waiting for data. Uh, and if the GPIO level on the input pin has changed, uh, then it decides how long the period was for. So if it was a start bit, it, it will estimate the period that each bit is from that start bit. Uh, and it will just take, it will, each time it receives a bit, it will, it will um, review what period a bit is by the length of that bit and find the shortest bit. Um, but each time uh, around the loop, it will just um, get the bit, decide how long it thinks a bit is, whether it's a binary zero or one, and then just add it to the the data bytes, which are in the receive buffer. I'll go through that in more detail in the previous video. It's not really, I won't cover it too much detail here. And then what, if the period between the bits received is longer than the end period of transmission, it, rec it considers that the end of transmission and that's all the data received. Uh, it just does a val validity check it see if it there's enough bytes received for for a packet of data uh, and checks if the period of each bit uh, is long enough to be uh, valid for for the kind of data we're sending and then it just goes through and it populates the data packet with uh, allocates from the bytes received uh, into the data packet for each, uh, each of the types of data item. So it rebuilds the, re reconstructs the packet basically uh, from what was transmitted. So that's all done down up to here up until the checksum, which is last byte, which is transmitted. It puts that into the data packet as well. And it does uh, certain validity checks. Um, so up here where it's receiving the signature, if it can, it's comparing it with the signature it should get on the data transmission. And if it doesn't match any, any on any of the bytes, then it will just flag it as a, an invalid um, transmission and ignore it. Uh, and down here, um, it re recreates a checksum and it compares it with a checksum which was transmitted in uh, with, the, with the message. And if they don't match, then it will say it's an invalid packet checksum. So some, somehow it's either been corrupted or it wasn't meant for this application and it will throw it out. Uh, but if that works and the data looks correct and it decrypts the data uh, and it just reconstructs it into characters and outputs it onto the display uh, and so you can see the un unencrypted message and then it resets all the da all the uh, data again so that when it goes around the loop it starts from a fresh set of data and uh, waits for the next message. So the final application is to receive a button press from either one of these buttons and uh, execute a separate application depending on which button's pressed. Um, it depends on uh, which application is run. Uh, so if I look in the source code, so I've got a configuration file here. 
and so it identifies a series of bytes which is uh, which will be transmitted on each button press uh, each one's different so this one ends in six six this one's ends in five six uh, for button one and two and then it executes a different uh, application depending on um, which button's pressed and you, you can make this file as big as you want and you can react on however many button presses different types of button press you want uh, and the actual applications uh, themselves all they do is they just echo onto the screen which which application has been executed so either executed one or executed two uh, and then this is the application itself so this one just like uh, the other two receiving applications it sits in a loop it was, waits to receive data like they do uh, and then when, if I press uh, the first button, it executes um, um, RX1 match. And if I press the second button, it executes RX2 match. And so that's very simple. I won't go through the code on this one because it's exactly the same, basically, as the other two receiving applications. You can look at the code yourself. All it does once it's received the data is it compares the signatures that are received with the signatures in this uh, any file. Uh, and it just shells out to whatever script needs to be run, uh, depending on what button's pressed. But you could just make it call a different Python function rather than executing a, a shell command. But um, so you can remotely, basically, remotely control your Raspberry Pi from something like one of these key fob type devices.